so important to have an understanding of these, especially the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis, because we are being attacked in a very special way in these areas, and it is having devastating effects upon our society. Anytime we deviate from the Word of God, the practice of the society and the individual find itself in um, difficulty and causing problems w within uh, uh, their relationships as well as in our society. You ever wondered what it would be like to live in the time of the judges when um, well, what was the problem with the judges? Well, they forgot, right? They forgot the word for which they were given. So they had to go through a cycle. Um, and so I say that when we turn from the scriptures and the Bible as our anchor, we have just, each of us being our own boats, now or adrift amidst Hurricane Dorian without an anchor. And you will be blown in any direction for which the wind blows. But if your anchor holds, okay, then you will be a boat that is a lifesaver. And people will want to, some will not want you, and others will be saying, where have you been? <laughs> that you might tell me how I might be saved and live in a life in a situation that we uh, are in in the 21st century. So um, you have a great advantage of knowing the word of God. And you could be at a greater disadvantage knowing the Word of God if we don't live it, if we don't proclaim it. Isn't that sad if you know it and we're not living it? And if you're really honest, you, you will say to me, well, yeah, Prof, but man, I, I, I'm in a war. I'm fighting all the time. That's right. <coughs> we are. And... Uh, we want to win more than we lose, right? And so that we might be able to proclaim a life of what the scripture would call blameless or upright for the glory of his precious name. So what I'd like to do to, tonight, I always do it, is to kind of get an introduction from you all because part of your education is not just coming and hopefully listening to me that I have something to say. But it is also your interaction with one another. You say you want to be a minister of the word of God and minister of the Lord. Well, are you <coughs> starting now <laughs> here in class? One of the reasons why we have most of the times in our classrooms tables, if you notice, mm -hmm. they, uh, is that it, it, to spawn community. Uh, instead of desks, right, in a row, you know, where you can just come in and sit down and, and leave, right? So it's important for us to get to know each other. And I, I will know that when you start from table to table, begins to talk and check everybody out and see if everything's there. Because one day you may come in and you're not doing well. Because if you ask, as I was a pastor for 20 years, and I... Uh, I took serious my shepherdhood, and so I would say many times to those who came on Sunday morning, uh, how's your soul? Now, if I said to you, how are you doing? You could say whatever you want to say. Yeah. You could be dying on the inside and say, I'm fine. <laughs> but I told my congregation, if I ask you, how's your soul? Don't mess with me. I'm your pastor. And yet I also said to them, but if you tell me every time, every Sunday you're doing well, you're probably lying to me, right? Because I, do I don't do well every time. I want to. 
<coughs> and your maturity level is, what do you do when you don't do well? Hmm. Let's make that one through. What do you do when you don't do well? And that's your maturity level, or where you are. And so, we need to encourage one another in the most holy faith. This is not just a school. Uh, this is beyond a school. And the day that I feel like this school is going just to be academics, I'm out. Okay? I want it to be high academics. I would not be here. But it has to be more than that. <coughs> it has to be that we're, this is my figure of speech, okay? We must be climbing the Himalayas of his word. That we might reach a little closer to the summit of his face. Because it is the glory of him whom we seek. And so I hope that the study of the word will cause you to climb the Himalayas of his word. Because there's, there are, as uh, I have experienced in my younger days or when my boys uh, took me up a mountain, there are flowers in the summertime at, uh, at tree line, 10, 11,000 going to 14 that you can't find anywhere else. They only grow up there and they only bloom at a certain time. And when I was up there, I just happened to get, I guess, at the, at the peak because I was stepping all over them. I mean, you couldn't help it. They were everywhere. Just beautiful flowers on the, this uh, growing up out of the ground in the summertime. And you would never know that unless you had climbed the, him, had climbed the Rockies, right? Mm -hmm. Or be able to drive up the Rockies, right? <laughs> a few places. And that's what you will have. The privilege. The privilege of coming to know God in such a level that you would grow in grace and that you might see his face. Because if your studies does not lead you to the face of Christ or to the feet of Christ, then you are studying for the wrong reasons. I want you to do good in your academics. But it's a problem. It's a possibility that you can go through the school and be worse off spiritually when you come out the other end. That's not what we want. A lot more knowledge, I hope. But knowledge doesn't make you mature. But you can't get maturity without knowledge. So we want to take our knowledge and by the grace of God ask that the Spirit of God would make it in such a way that we find ourselves pursuing what the scripture says is the glory of God. That's one of my pet peeves for school. It's because I'm sure you've heard that before, right? That you are to pursue the glory of God. But do you know the definition of the glory of God? And I find that very few people can give me one. They give me descriptions of it. But whether we eat, or whether we drink, or whatever we do, do all to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. The pursuit of his glory. And if you get your satisfaction and joy from that, you're good. No one can steal your joy. No one can steal your joy if you're being satisfied with something outside of this realm. We are either living in Ecclesiastes, vanity, vanity, all is vanity, because we are living in vanity, because this world has been cursed. But if you're living outside of that in the sense of the Christian life or pursuing the satisfaction and joy in God alone, ah, no one can steal your joy. Well, all right. 
so the Lord will allow, yes. Can you please define the glory of God? Sure. Everybody want to get ready? I'm doing that. I also <coughs> sense, what's your name? Alyssa. Alyssa. Yes, Alyssa. If, uh, if you will pray for me also, I'm giving a, I'm doing a men's retreat at the end, beginning of October on the glory of God. Amen. So, uh, uh, anyway, I need prayer that I would be able to communicate to them these beautiful truths that God has been pleased to shine in my heart, dealing with the glory of God. The, the number one reason why you and I were created we're going to learn from Genesis is for his glory because we're made in the image and likeness of God and we more than any other creation is able to reflect his glory and that's why we are made and if we can get satisfaction in that you're good. Well, here's what I have defined as glory. Like I said, I, I don't find good definitions, so I made my own. Okay? Um, it, is, it is the visual or conceptual, because sometimes we don't see it, but we see it in our mind's eye. You know what I mean? We see it in our mind. Sometimes when you study the attributes of God, you, you go, I can't see that physically, but I, I see it within my, in my mind and my soul of what God is speaking by the spiritual concept. So it is a visual or conceptual manifestation of the beauty, perfection, and excellence of the work and character of God. It is a visual or a conceptual manifestation of the beauty, perfection, and excellence of the work and character or attributes of God. And that's what we should be displaying. And that's what we should get joy and satisfaction in. That takes you back to your theology, uh, uh, the attributes of God. That's what I'm teaching in uh, one of my courses this semester, God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit, and dealing with the attributes of God. How many have, have taken that course? You remember that when it talks about the different attributes of God, it talks about either the communicable or incommunicable attributes. Mm -hmm. Since we're made in the image and likeness of God, uh, we should be able to reflect his character. Not 100% because we're not God, but we're in his image. And so therefore, the incommunicable at the attributes of God, I can't even touch, right? I'm not a little bit omniscient, okay? I'm not even a little bit. So all the omnis are beyond us. But the communicable attributes of God is love. Can we not love? Not to his degree, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can love. And justice and mercy and grace and goodness and truth. These are all attributes of God, right? And so when we reflect those by the way we act, by our attitudes and our actions, then we are glorifying God because we are now making a manifestation of his glory. It talks about Jesus in Mark 10, 45, that he came not to be served. If anybody should have been served, whew, he should have but not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So serving 
demonstrated the character of God. So when you serve at your church, can you? I don't know about you, but I started churches by God's grace, and I signed up for cleaning the church. So I had to clean the toilet just like everybody else, right? Can you clean a toilet to the glory of God? Yeah, you can. How do you do it? I do it like I was doing it for him, right? Or whatever task, mowing the yard, uh, cleaning a room, uh, going to work, doing your work, your job. These are things we can manifest the glory of God in it. And if we do it because we want, again, to get our pleasure and satisfaction in it, then no one can steal your joy. But if you, if there's something that you have to have here, and somebody blocks it, or it's being blocked, you're not happy. You don't have joy. And it's vanity. And even if we are living for the glory of God, we will experience vanity. But we can still have a joyful attitude if we understand why and why we're, why we're here. And even though this vanity I'm experiencing, I am to reflect him. And, and, I'll, and if I'm reflecting it, he is pl pleased. And if he's pleased, I'm pleased. But is that true? <clears throat> Just think about it. If you, if, you can, if you can get an attitude, if you can by God's grace get to a point by saying, if God is pleased no matter what's happening to me, I'm, okay. I, I'm pleased. I, I, I'm glad. I'm joyous. It may not be a happy situation, but I can have joy in the midst of sorrow and pain and death and all kinds of things, right? What I'm talking about is really the very essence of the Christian life. And I like to teach it in a positive way, and I like to teach it in a negative way. I like going through the book of Ecclesiastes, talking about vanity of vanity. Anybody goes, yeah, yeah, I got that one. Plenty of go around, right? What about the joy of him who is so lovely? It can satisfy our souls. If I had nothing, but I have that attitude by God's grace, I could be joyous. Amen. And God tests those things, doesn't he? Yes. Some of you know that the Lord was pleased to test us in the flood two years ago. So, how you, let's see how you do it. See, you're... you're Written your joy and pleasure in God, okay? <laughs> Let's flood your house. <laughs> it's good. It's a good test. I hope we pass. Well, let me uh, share with you just who I am, if you don't know. Um, and then I'll let you all share just a little, not like I'm going to share, because if you did, you want to get through the class. I'd love to hear every story. Um, grew up in a kind of a nominal Christian home where the Bible was respected and gone to church and God was pleased to bring me to faith either at the age of 10 and 17 I hate to know where I would have been between the age of 10 and 17 I had the knowledge for 10 for sure not sure if it was a saving knowledge you know that? It could, it could be just a knowledge and not a saving knowledge of Christ. Went off to the University of Oklahoma and that's where God really got a hold of me. Used Campus Crusade for Christ and an individual who was my father in the faith where he took the book of Romans and used it as a stepping off point to teach all kinds of doctrine through exposition of the scriptures. I went to this church and I go, man, I've learned more in six months than I have in my entire life. Well, it just happened that those three pastors and the, the elder that was coming down, who was my father in faith, for <laughs> Dallas Seminary graduates. I didn't know who Dallas Seminary was. 
And so God grew me up. I was out on the campus sharing my faith and getting my spiritual nose bloodied and all the things of the 60s, late 60s and early 70s. It was a radical time, and so I want to be in a uh, spiritual way, not necessarily in a physical way, a way I looked like some guys did. I want to be radical for Christ. And so uh, God taught me many things that grew for his glory. Uh, I was in pharmacy school, and so um, when I finished, I thought maybe I'd go into ministry, but I had 1,500 hours I needed to get to get my license if I passed the two tests you had to pass. And pharmacy school was already five, uh, five years, <coughs> so four, and then you got another about a year for internship, and you got to take your test. Oh, well, anyway. So I went home to my hometown. They, they wanted me to become part of the uh, business there if everything worked out. And I told them, well, maybe uh, I may be going somewhere else. I just didn't know what God was doing with me. And God brought my wife to be back home. She was a hometown girl. Um, we, she had been religious but not saved. You know, that's interesting too. <laughs> you know, grew up in church, lost. And a lot of came, us are. Yeah. <laughs> and she came to know the Lord and she said, I'm behind. And she was, she wanted, she was pressing forward. Just sharing Jesus everywhere and wanted to be with anything with Jesus. So we got together and God was pleased to uh, bring us together and married in uh, February 75 and 1975 in the fall I was at Dallas Theological Seminary and for four years then having a family working on the side so you see I know you're what you're going through <laughs> and taking 12 uh, to 15 hours of a <coughs> master's degree at Dallas Seminary uh, and uh, working on the side. So I know what you're doing. I gave us sleep either. And God was pleased to allow me to graduate. And when I did, I went to Kerrville, Texas. So, man, I didn't realize how beautiful Hill Country was in Texas. Mm -hmm. And the Lord allowed me to start a church there. Um, I was there for nine years as a pastor. And then I moved to Spring, Texas for another pastorship. And uh, then I started another church about five or six years later in Spring. And uh, there's this organization called the Houston Bible Institute bugging me for about four years, starting in 1988, to start teaching. So in 1992, I started teaching at the Houston <coughs> Bible Institute, HBI, which is what we were here before we became the College of Biblical Studies. And so I've been teaching here since 92, by God's grace. And then in 98, they asked me to come and be part of the chairman of the Minister Skills Department. And they've continued to let me teach. So uh, it's a great privilege. You asked me if I would be in this position, I would say, no way. Me? No. And I wouldn't trade it. And I'm thankful to God for this school. And I'm praying that it will be kept by God's grace for years to come. And we don't get too big for our britches, you know. We're not in Indianapolis and Fort Wayne and online. <laughs> okay, good. I'm glad. As long as we stay true to God. Amen. Stay true to Him. Stay, stay true to the call. To preach and teach and the word of God that you might go out and do his work for his glory. Right? Then we can go home. Right? Do you long for home? Yeah. yeah. Good. If you don't, you should be. You say, well, how do you do that? Well, we'll talk about it as we go through. Well, you long for home. Right? You get foreign people come to the United States are so appreciative of the United States, but if you talk to them long enough, you know what they'll talk about? Home. They're at home. <laughs> so which one do you talk about? Here or there? The only problem is, is that when you wake up, everything you see is beckoning you to the wrong home. 
Remember 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18? Talks about that which you see is temporal and falling away, but that which you do not see is eternal. And that's what we ought to be seeking. Yeah, I say, I don't see it. So I have to wake up in the mornings at times and literally say to me, myself, eternity. Live for eternity today, Steve. And I seek out people who want to talk like that and live like that. So, Alyssa, is it, is it advantageous to talk about glory? If, if, if the scripture says, whatever we eat or whatever we drink or whatever we do, do all to the glory of God. So the question I would have for you to contemplate, how do you take your Coke or your water at this moment and drink it for the glory of God? Do you think that's worth discussing? Yes. Yeah. How many people will want to discuss it with you? Not many, I'm afraid. <laughs> I seek them out. I had a lawyer to constantly call me and says, well, one of my boys wants to play basketball. Can you play basketball to the glory of God? Because if you can, I don't want him to play. I said, well, let's talk about it. Because I had thought through those things. I had some athletic family back in those days. But do you think that's a good conversation? How do you drive here to the... How, how do you come to school? How do you do your homework? How do you do you what to cook food or, or 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 mow the lawn? How do you do that to the glory of God? Isn't it worthy of your thought? The, I, I will warn you ahead of time. People think you're not. <laughs> but you, if you get a little discouraged, just come on in my office. We'll have some fun talking. I want to think about glory, right? Well, I'm probably taking too much. It's already 30 minutes after. Uh, Paul, won't you start us? I'm going this way and just tell your name at five. And before we enter in to these things. Paul in Romans 5 says in verse 2, uh, speaking about our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained. So it's through whom? Who whom refers back to the Lord Jesus Christ in verse 1. Through whom we have obtained an introduction. Or that word can mean access. By faith into his grace, unmerited and deserved favor, right? Or I did not receive what I should have received, right? Mm -hmm. In which we stand. So we have an access by, uh, by faith into his grace in which we stand. We need to stand in grace, right? And we exalt in, the, in hope of the glory of God. We exalt in the hope of the glory of God. And so he's speaking to a believer. He's speaking to the one who has access to grace and now is standing in grace and knows how to stand in his grace. Mm -hmm. And he's saying, therefore, in, in that position, we are to exalt. We are to praise. We are to have an earthly viewpoint. An earthly view. No. Uh, an exalt means I'm lifting up and exalting him. Mm -hmm. Yes. I know that there's several definitions of the word grace. Mm -hmm. Here, when Paul's writing, what definition of grace is he talking about? Well, I use the standard definition of undeserved favor. Mm -hmm. Or I, if you say it in the negative, as I said a while ago, 
I did not receive what I did deserve. I, I mean, I didn't deserve. So, so uh, you can say it the negative, or you can say it the positive. I like the positive. It is the unmerited favor of God. I didn't merit it. I shouldn't have gotten it. I should have been cast in the lake of fire. I should have been uh, smashed by his wrath. Therefore, being satisfied by God had been then satisfied by his justice and perfectly just in doing so. But it, for some reason, known only unto God, I didn't get that. I got an unmerited favor of part from the Almighty. The difference between a saved soul and one who's going to hell is grace. Because <clears throat> everybody deserves it. Yeah. And he gives grace. And when you are understand, uh, listen, when you understand the access into that marvelous grace and that that comes upon your soul and it sinks in and now not only that it sinks in what I mean by sinking in is now I not only know that I'm saved by that grace but now I stand in that grace now as a believer walking understanding this grace if I truly understand it, one of the natural responses according to the Apostle Paul is I will exalt in the hope of the glory of God. Now hope is not a Texas hope. Okay, it's not a hope so or may not may so hope. Hope, biblical hope is the confident assurance that God will do exactly what he says he will do. The problem with that is some people think God promised something that he hasn't promised. And they start putting their hat on it. And he said, well, God didn't come through, so therefore God's not God or whatever. Well, they placed their hope in something God said I did. Don't put your hope there. I didn't say that. That's what you think I said. It's not what I said. But you are to exalt. I don't know. What, what do you exalt in? What are you constantly are telling people that you, re, that, you are, or that you are lifting up and saying it's great, you know? I mean, if you listen around, it, it's the Astros, right? Man, they're doing great. You know, they're going to make it do it this year, right? They're very exalted in the Astros, okay? Well, I, got, I hope they do well. But I'm not exalting in the Astros. That's not my hope. Okay. To the believer who stands in grace, who has his access in this grace, who is swimming in it. How's that? What should come from him no matter if he's going through verses 3 through 5 or not? He ought to be exalting in the hope of the glory of God. The confident assurance that glory is mine. Glory is mine. Now what will stamp out that vision is your misunderstanding of verses 3 through 5. Because notice when he, kept, he, he says here, he exalts in the hope of the glory. Then he says, and not only this... <laughs> That we exalt uh, in tribulations. You kind of go, wait a minute, whoa, 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 Paul. You sure you got this right? And you didn't make a mistake here. I'm not, I'm going, I, I like glory. I, I love that. But I exalt in tribulations. You will exalt in them knowing. And if you don't know, then you won't. Even when you know, there's a tendency not to do it. But if you don't know, you're not even in the ballpark. You with me? So, you got the exalting in the glory of God. 
And I gave you a definition <coughs> of glory. Now he says, I will exalt in tribulation. On the only reason I will exalt in it is I know something. I know what God's going to do with this. I don't know how he's going to do it in this situation. But I know he's going to do something. In my tribulation, knowing the tribulation brings about a perseverance. A continuance. That I'm, I'm holding fast. Under the pressure, that's what the Greek word is speaking about. A pressure of coming down in what? You're holding up. <laughs> okay. Now, I'm not holding up because I'm strong. I'm holding up, I'm strong in Him. I, I, I have, the reason why I'm strong in Him is that I have an access into His grace. And because I am now standing in that grace, I can exalt even when these things happen. Knowing that perseverance gives me a proven character. Do you realize that pressure is, is wanting to mold you? And if you, if you don't do well, you know what happens? you ever been on a merry-go-round? You just come back, you cycle around again, you know. I want off. Right? I'm ready to get off of this one. Okay? And if we don't learn, then we come back around on a merry-go-round again. Uh, I exalt in our tribulation knowing that tribulation brings forth that I will persevere if I'm standing in grace. And that perseverance will give me a proven character. And that proven character will, dev will bring forth, oh my goodness, we're back to hope again. <laughs> How about that? And since we're back to hope again, then I will exalt. <laughs> will I not? I'll get to preaching here if you don't watch it. <laughs> I get excited about these things. So I don't know what pressure you're going through. I, I, I have no idea what tribulations you're going through. But I want you to know, come into this school. Not because you're going to this class, not because I'm going to give you a lot of homework, but you're going to have, you're going to have problems coming to this church because the evil one does not want you to come. Just take it. Say, hey, this is good. It's all right, Lord. I'm going to exalt. I'm going to exalt in what you tell me to exalt in. In the hope of the glory, I'm going to exalt in tribulations because I'm going to, by your grace, the access into that grace that you gave me, and by the access of standing in that grace, that when the pressure of tribulations come, it's going to bring a proven character within me, and that proven character is going to cause me to persevere, and I'm going to have a hope to continue on. And that hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within it, our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which He has given us. Amen. So notice the fallacy of thinking <coughs> because I'm having problems, I'm entering into tribulations. Life is not going like I want it to, or it is uh, uh, <laughs> kind of like a, a bowl of cherries It's the pits, right? Mm -hmm. And it's just giving me all kinds of trouble. Good. You go, it's good. It's good. I'm going to stand in grace. I'm going to see the work. I'm going to see it proves my character. I'm going to find a hope in the glory of Christ. It's cutting my roots here. Why? Because this place, hey, I'd rather go home. I, I, I want to have more heavenly thoughts. I, I, I'm, I'm down here too, too much. I need to cut off some of my worldly stinking thinking, right? Mm -hmm. So that I can have a godly character. And a living, proven hope to exalt into the glory of God. And if that's what God's doing in your life, you ought to praise Him. Nobody likes the tribulations, but knowing, <clears throat> knowing what they could do for you if you will respond by the power of the Spirit of God. To the grace that he has given you. 
and glory will be your constant plate that you will eat and enjoy his presence. Well, I try to give you a little bit of that each time we come before we start our lecture. And since we had to do all the other stuff in between, I'll give you a break. And when we come back, we'll start an introduction into the Pentateuch. Okay? It's an introduction to, uh, to the Pentateuch. And to the, uh, we'll get more specific into Genesis maybe next week. You'll notice the charts that I told you I was going to bring up. You can look at these later. Uh, it's, they, some of them still don't have a purpose and a theme statement on them, but you'll see that uh, this is the kind of thing we're looking at. Yes. I was going to ask about the origin of the word penitude. Because like I told somebody about it and they didn't know what it was. And then I thought I was like, I wonder if that's like a Greek word or what does penit is it an English word penitude? Penta five. You know, I'll have to think a second. Um, where it comes from. I want to say Latin, but I'm not for sure. Penta meaning mm. five. And so um, I, uh, I'm sure somebody knows, but I don't know. We can look up the etymology. I probably knew it one time. <laughs> I was going to ask, what's the difference between the Pentateuch and the Torah? It's the same. same. It's the same. It's just, you know, the Torah uh -huh. is, it, that's how they would pronounce it in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. So it's the Hebrew word for law. And therefore, uh, if you notice that the actual statement by Moses or when Moses writes, he saw, they always refer to it, uh, to the law of Moses. Mm. And so when you technically use the word Torah, uh, you are looking at the law, okay? Or the, uh, can be understood to be the five books. Sometimes the word is broadened to anything in the Old Testament, but technically it is the five books of Moses. Specifically, the law that's within the five books. Which is the, is the law considered the Ten Commandments? Well, it's beyond the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments would be the pinnacle of the, of the law. But as we will see as we go through it, there are other kinds of laws, the sacrificial laws that they were responsible to do for certain things, there's certain feasts that would need to be done. A certain um, in the other places he'll talk about as we go through what you are to do on certain situations and that will be all part of the law okay. Thank you. and you will answer that question as we go through it so good question <coughs> good question so you can come up and look at these if you like some or, or after class. So, what I'm about to go over, yes, Jeremiah, um, Jeremy. The uh, Pentateuch, it's, uh, I just think it's five scrolls. Yeah, I just don't know whether it's, um, it's what, Latin. It's Latin, Latin. What's, what's what for me. That was my first, first inclination to be Latin, so, because it, it doesn't come from Hebrew. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you, you realize that early on um, uh, we have the uh, Latin or translated into Latin and uh, Jerome in Jerusalem, matter of fact in 400 Jerome began to uh, translate the both Hebrew Greek and Hebrew texts into uh, Latin we have ultimately what is called the Latin Vulgate and it happened to continue for centuries. <laughs> All right, what I'm about to um, go over is usually not fun. <laughs> People say, well, where are you going all through this stuff? You know, I want to get into the Bible. <laughs> but yeah, I want you to be aware of, because 
you, because you've gone to a Bible college, are going to be asked questions that are going beyond just what the particular verse in the Bible means. <clears throat> You're going to be asked certain questions about certain things and because they don't know what it is or they're going to start using language and you're going to go, uh-oh, why are they using that for? You know, where did they get that? So some of this uh, will be tedious. Some of this you say, well, why does he talk about all this? Well, because <clears throat> you talk about the Old Testament and you begin to read some of the books that you're going to have to read or you pick up and they start talking about J and, and the P and E and you're going to go JDP, JDPD and all that. They go, what is that? Well, we're going to talk about that. But before we do, I want to take you through a, an overview of biblical theology of the Old Testament. And um, uh, why would you do that? Well, the biblical theology helps me to understand the basis of putting together the Old Testament so that I can properly understand uh, what, not only what is said, but what particular things that will, is going to be carried through the entire Old Testament. And it begins at the beginning of the Old Testament. Okay? So, the theme of the Bible, that's pretty broad. How would you go about um, understanding the theme of the Bible? Well, if you did it in a correct way, you would do what you're going to do with the book of Deuteronomy to every book of the Bible. And as you're doing Deuteronomy, you would give the, a purpose statement, right? You're going to have to do. So you would study the whole books, all the books of the Bible, and have a chart on each of the books and their understanding, and you say, well, my purpose statement for the books of the Bible are all these 66 statements. And then I would take those 66 statements and say, this is what, and then synthesize that into one statement, and that would be what the Bible says. That's how you properly do it. Does that take time? <laughs> my statement is that God purposes to bring glory to himself by establishing his kingdom through redemption history I believe in a comprehensive statement that's what the Bible is saying God purposes to bring glory to himself by establishing his kingdom through redemption history. Taking you all the way back, uh, all the way through to Revelation chapter 5, where there is a book in heaven, and John is translated to heaven, and there is a statement, who is Worthy to open the book and to break its seals. Now, that becomes interesting because that's what the book of Revelation is about, isn't it? Breaking of the seals and certain judgments that would come from that. Well, the statement is asked and there is a silence in heaven. And John begins to weep. Uh, it's not just a, it's an interesting Greek word. He, he is heaving in great sorrow as though there is now no hope because no one can open the book. And you come to understand that that book represents all the promises and all the covenants that God promised to establish his kingdom on earth and enter into the heavens and new heavens and new earth. And if no one can open that, those promises cannot be fulfilled. And of course, he says, stop weeping. 
there is one who is worthy. And of course it was the lamb and who looks like a lion and the lamb who takes the book and heaven explodes. And then you begin to see in chapter 6 the seal judgments because who is now breaking the seals? The lamb who took the book. And he has to break the seals. You think it's only the seals, and then you find that's the trumpets, and then there's vials. But at the end of all that, what? The kingdom is established, and ultimately into the new heavens and new earth. So, I believe that's the culmination of the what God has planned upon the earth. <clears throat> and he did it to bring glory to himself. All right? Let's look then, starting with Genesis. Uh, uh, this theme, and see if uh, it can be worked out that I am correct. We see in this a covenant of creation uh, in verses uh, uh, 26 and 28 when he tells man and the woman to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. He's going to give and he's going to make them in his image and his likeness and they are to, to uh, uh, rule, verse 26 chapter 1, over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over every cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth and God created man in his own image, the image of God he created them, male and female he created them and God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and rule over it. The fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So God placed his image in only one creature. That creature called human being, right? Male and female can reflect God's glory more than anything else that he created. Because we can reflect his glory through what? His image. All right. uh, we are not to our full potential at this time, right? Because chapter 3 happened. Mm -hmm. yeah. But we are headed toward that. We will be a, we more than anything else is able to express God's image, which is His glory. And then He told man to do what? Three things. You look in the text. You tell me. I'm not going to do every do all the things for you. Rule, multiply, and fill. Oh, good. He's going to rule, multiply, and fill. All right? Good. Excellent. So he has given them a, a mandate. You are to rule. Why would he want them to rule? Now take your cues that he placed his image in them. And why did he place his image in them? To reflect what? His glory. So how is it us ruling will reflect that? Because God rules everything else. God rules, right? He sits upon the vault of the earth and does whatever he pleases. And it's always good, perfect, and acceptable, though we may not understand it. And now he's giving us part of that in the sense of displaying it on earth that we would rule well. What else? Multiply. 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 Why would he want us to multiply? So his name would be great. Because his God, name would be great and his... God is everywhere. His glory. His, his glory would be then going there. Okay? So, okay, so he wants to multiply his glory and why did he say fill the earth? So it would be all over, his glory would be all over the earth. How about that? It's all about his glory. <laughs> my, my, my. And yet the word glory is not used here, is it? But it's all over the page. Now answer your question. Do you think that Satan might be again that kind of thing? <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. 
So, so what we see there, um, <coughs> the rule is challenged in chapter 3. What is man? Man was to do what? Rule. And, what, and he did what? He didn't rule well, did he? He fell. So, and who caused humanly or the instrument of that fall? Satan did. Okay? So, the evil one was challenging the very three commands, and he's already, the, the number one one would be his rule. All right? And then the covenant of promise in Genesis 3, uh, it talks about well, there's going to be a, 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 a certain kind of promise, right? Mm -hmm. what, this is an interesting. You, we would not understand this text apart from the rest of the canon of Scripture. But with the canon of Scripture, and that's called theology, we can come to understand this uh, covenant of promise. You can call it whatever you want, but I call it that. And it says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you will bruise him on the heel. And I don't know about you, but I'll just be blinking. I go, what in the world is that? <laughs> Yeah, okay. Now, <laughs> we're, we're going to see what that is now by looking at the theology of, uh, of this uh, as we would understand it looking back and helping us on this kind of thing. The you is the serpent which Satan used. So it's basically Satan. The woman is Eve. Yeah. Okay. So we got that. So it, there is a representative in this. Between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. The your seed is those who will ultimately be unbelievers who will be part of Satan's group. They're not, they're not demonic. I'm just saying they are the ones that will be his people's representative. In John 8, 44, uh, somebody want to read that? You are of your father the devil, and you want to do this, the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So in other words, he represents every person who ultimately is an unbeliever and will not become a believer. Okay? That's, that's his seed. And then her seed is our representative through Jesus Christ. Somebody want to read Galatians chapter 3 verse 29? And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to promise. All right. So we then are seeds from uh, the Lord Jesus Christ that, that flows all the way to the Messiah who would come to take care of the problem, right? Okay. So unbelievers and believers, he will crush the head. Christ's death on the cross will defeat Satan. When he dies. And then you will crush the heel. In other words, you will crucify the Messiah. Mm -hmm. But you, not many. <laughs> it, it will be a mortal wound, even though it was a mortal wound, because he was what? He was raised from the dead. Mm -hmm. right. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, uh, the movie, the, the Passion of the Christ, you remember in the garden? Yes, uh, yeah. I, I can remember vividly when he was in the garden and all of a sudden that snake showed up and I went, oh come on, there was no snake in the garden <laughs> I was just starting to get you know, you know starting to get upset and everything and then when he raised his heel and he hit that snake with his heel, I went that was brilliant in its theology 
because that's exactly what he was going to do. He was going to crush Satan by dying on the cross. And they pictured it there in the garden. From one garden to another garden. <laughs> okay. And though it did not literally happen, it did happen in what was done at Calvary's cross. Because Satan was defeated. He was crushed. But he, his heel was only hurt because in the dent, even though he died, he rose again from the grave. So right here, at the very beginning in Genesis 3.15, we have the hope of the glory of God. Huh, I think we talked about that. Tonight, didn't we? <laughs> the hope of the glory of God right here pictured. Here we see the dark part of humanity because man fell, right? <clears throat> this is bad. How could this be? How can, oh no. And yet, God says, I got this in control and, and tells us the gospel in a riddle in a sense in Genesis 3 verse 15. Everybody okay? Yep. All right. So, though... The fall happens. The seed of the woman is the hope that will come. Do you wonder why there's the importance of genealogies throughout the Old Testament? If you understood this verse, you would go, I'm looking for that one. And so when we come to Noah's family, that's it. Because they were destroyed. Which one comes? Which one is the seed? Which were which 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 son does it go through? Did you ever wonder? It tells you in Genesis 10. Yeah. Notice it. In Genesis 10, uh, verse 27, God may enlarge Japheth, and he dwells in the tent of Shem. Or in verse 26. He has also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be servant. May God enlarge Japheth, but let him dwell in the tent of Shem. It is Shem. You ever heard of a Semite? We use the word anti-Semitism, which is bad, right? Well, it comes from Shem, a Shemite. Abraham was a Shemite. Abraham had who? Called Isaac. Isaac had... Jacob and, Jacob and Jacob had 12 sons from the 12 tribes of Israel one of those would be Judah which in the time of Jacob uh, he leans on his staff just before he dies and Genesis 49 blesses each one of his sons when he came to Judah he says the scepter the one was the king will not depart from Judah until Shiloh comes, until the rest giver comes. Ooh. So what did Messiah come from? Judah. Not only from Judah, 2 Samuel chapter 7 in the Davidic covenant, he must come from David's line. Mm -hmm. They begin to follow the lines. Why? Looking for the promise of Genesis 3.15. Because he is the answer to all the problems that happened at the car. Following the line. You wonder when you, you, you read Matthew chapter 1 and you skip it because of the genealogy? <laughs> but to a Jewish person, that wasn't boring. They were going, this is it. The one whom we promised, Abraham. You know, from Abraham all the way down to David through David, this is Messiah. He's the one. Looking for him. So if you were an Old Testament uh, student of the Word, which I knew you would be if you were back then, and you happen to be living in the intertestamental period, you go, where is it? You see, we, we went all the way to, really, Second Chronicles is the last book in the Hebrew text. 
Malachi's last prophet, right? And he didn't come. And there is no more prophets. And why didn't he come? And finally, there comes John the Baptist. He goes, da 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 He's here. <laughs> He's ready to go. This is the one you've been looking for. So all of the Old Testament is pointing toward this one who would come to take care of the problem that they messed up in the garden. It all starts in Genesis, right? Okay. The promise of Genesis 3.15, often called the Pro-Evangelion, the first proclamation of the gospel. But it's kind of in riddle form, isn't it? You need the rest of the entire Bible and its theology to really unpack un un this beautiful, important promise that God has given you. So is theology important? Yes. yes. Yeah. You wonder why you take four <laughs> theology courses at CBS? Mm -hmm. So that you can put it together. Some understandings of God's Word. Besides studying all the books. Now, from there, we see that the multiplication. So we have the problem of the uh, rule being cha challenged, and God saying, I'll take care of that. It's taken a while, hasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Now, and the flood comes. And why does the flood come? That the whole race... The human race was polluted. And I believe in Genesis 6, when we get there, I think it's also demonically polluted. Except one family. <laughs> and it just happened to be that family was in the line. Huh. Imagine that. And why were they spared? Noah found what? Grace. Grace in the eyes of the Lord. Mm -hmm. That's you and me. If we know him tonight. The only reason we know him is Grace. He was dead and the whole multiplication had become polluted. And so Satan seems to be winning there, right? And God pulls it out and saves to start again in Genesis 9 and 10. So the multiplication was challenged. Then, after the multiplication was challenged and we received the Noahic covenant, right? And the sign of the Noahic covenant is? Rainbow. Rainbow. So... Uh, people think I'm very fanatical when the rainbow comes up because I don't care where I am and I don't care who's listening to me. I look up and I point and say, there's a God in heaven still. Mm -hmm. <laughs> people come to <laughs> God's weird. But it is. Think about it. The Bible talks about a rainbow and he promises and he rains out the rainbow again. He's caught generation after generation after generation. There's been a rainbow promise that he wouldn't do this again. And so he tells them in Genesis 9 just what he told them before. What? Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And what did they do? They came together. <laughs> the very opposite of what they're supposed to be doing. Again, challenging what God says. The evil one was involved again. Rule Multiply and fill in the air. And so God, what, what did God have to do? He had to change the languages and scatter the people again. So what does that tell you? That tells you that God wanted these things to happen. And now there is opposition that's coming against every point in the thing. And I want to make an application here. Are you in ministry? And you're doing what God says? And all of a sudden, there's all kinds of problems coming at you. And you go, oh, no. Oh, no, you should say, I should I, I, I've been expecting this. I just didn't know how it was coming. I, I refuse to give in. I refuse to give up. 
I'm going to do what God says. I'm going to handle it biblically, not out of anger. I'm going to do what God wants me to do in the midst of struggle. So we're in a war. And we will not get out of the war until Jesus comes. But we win. Okay? Even when things don't go as planned, and it looks like we're losing. In the end, we win. And so we ought to act like it and live like it to the glory of Christ. All right. I just gave you the first ten chapters of the book of Genesis. In a theology realm. I didn't, look, I didn't go through all the verses and everything, but I wanted you to know that's what's going on. Okay? And those are the big, major importance in what God is doing in those chapters. And when he comes to chapter 12, he's kind of going back to the seed again. Okay? Because he picks Abraham Abraham is the line of Shem. He was a Shemite, which is the line of the Messiah, right? To come. And he picked this individual and he gives him what we call the Abrahamic covenant by his name. And it is an unconditional promise, okay? And it deals with a land, a seed, and a blessing. LSB, not LSD. You got it forever. Right? <laughs> Land, seed, and blessing. And each one of these particular points of this unconditional Abrahamic covenant is further explained in a three other unconditional covenants. What we call the Palestinian covenant or land covenant the Davidic covenant, and in the new covenant. And so what I'm telling you is, there is an Abrahamic covenant, unconditional. God says, I'm going to do this. And it's going to deal with a land he's going to give them. It's going to give them a seed, and that seed has two aspects. A seed, which is the Messiah who comes, and the plurality of the seed of a people that will be part of that kingdom. And then there will be the blessing, and that blessing will come from the new covenant, which was shed at Calvary so that we might be saved. Okay? Um, yes? David? This is Davidic. Davidic? Okay. Yeah, Davidic covenant because it was given to David just like the Abrahamic was given to Abraham. But it has, goes beyond David, but it was given to David. So we call it the Davidic covenant, yeah, Second Samuel 7. I heard it right, I it right. Sure. And then the new covenant. That's the, what Jesus, when he took the third cup of the four cups of the, of the Passover, and, he's, and he says in the third cup something completely different than you're supposed to say, this is the new covenant in my blood. Whoa. You mean the one that was promised? In Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. Thank you. So, this is of, of in magnitude importance. Because what God says he's going to do, guess what? He's, he's going to do it. Now, for example, uh, Jacob's going to go down to Egypt. And they're going to stay there a long time, right? And then he brings them out of Egypt. Why? Because he promised them a, a piece of property. <laughs> okay? And so, if you know what he promises, you know what he's going to do. He, it may be a long time in our thinking, but it's right on time in God's thinking. And so, to understand the covenants, it's in, crucial in theology of understanding the, the, the uh, foundation of why the Pentateuch is saying what the Pentateuch is saying. 
And it finds its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Turn over to Galatians, which we were looking at. Chapter 3. Now, Chapter 3, verse 6, quotes Genesis 15, verse 6. It says, And even so, Abraham believed God, and it was, my text says, reckon. Now, that's a bad, that's a, that's a dangerous word in Texas, because we reckon so and reckon not. So we're not talking about a Texas reckon. We're talking about a biblical reckoning, which means to credit to you to put down to your account. It's like somebody depositing in your bank. Okay? That's the reckons that we should come understand from this text. So Abraham believed God and it was credited. It was set down to his account righteousness because he believed. Therefore, be sure that it is those who are, are, are of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Ooh. And scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying all the nations will be blessed in you. Now that goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 12 verse 3 when God first gave Abraham what we call the Abrahamic promise. Covenant. So, if you got your finger in Galatians, don't lose it. And now go back to Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. And I will bless those who bless you, Abraham, and the one who curse you, I will curse. Still going on today. And you, and in you, Abraham, all the families of the earth will be blessed. You kind of go, could you give me a little more about that? Because mm-hmm. I'm all, I, I'm not, I'm not part of those that family you talk about. <laughs> I'm one of those of the families of the earth kind of guy. Okay, because I'm not Jewish. Well, somehow I'm going to be blessed, and it comes, of course, through Christ. But He gives you a hint of it here. Right at the beginning in Genesis 12, verse 3. He will expand it in the new covenant in Jeremiah, again, 31. 31 through 34. Jesus will speak about it when he heads with the cup and says, this is the new covenant. He'd go to Calvary to die for our sins and he'd go, aha! Now I know what the new covenant is about. But Paul says in Galatians, that God preached the gospel to Abraham by this text. Isn't that something? And notice verse 29 of Galatians 3. If you belong to Christ, you are Abraham's offspring and you are heirs according to the promise. If somehow, some way I can get in Christ, I got it. And you get in Christ by believing what he has done at Calvary's cross. And he places you into the body of Christ. What I'm doing is is giving you sketches, I hope. Here are the beginnings of those statements that you know about maybe in in the New Testament. But they they, they began here in Genesis. Genesis chapter 12 in the Abrahamic covenant and the promise of a blessing that will be expanded in the new covenant blessing. When we come to the new covenant in Jeremiah, you go, oh yeah, I got that one. It all starts here. It really starts, if, if you stood at the cross and you understood what the cross 
was, and if your thought was, I wonder when God first mentioned the cross in his thinking, or at least had some aspect of the cross in mind, you'd go back and you would go back to Genesis and you go back to Genesis 12 and then you would go back to Genesis chapter 3. The verse 15, the pro-evangelion, the first proclamation of the gospel. Though it's riddled form, I'd say, but it's all right there. And why is that important? Because what happens in Genesis 3? fall happened. The fall happened. Mm -hmm. And right there when the fall happened, he says, I got a promise for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right there. Giving us a hope. I got this. Trust me. I'll take care of you. Every generation. <clears throat> trust God. He's going to take care of you. Trust God. The seed is coming. Trust God. Seed is coming. And then, then all of a sudden, if you're in the, I guess again, if you're in the intertestamental period, you would go, it's been three to four hundred years. No prophet. Nothing. And then all of a sudden, John the Baptist comes and says, he's here. <laughs> the one that we've been talking about since Genesis 3.15, he is here. All starting now in Genesis. Setting up everything so that we what a privilege we have, right? Mm -hmm. Just think if you look back then. Mm -hmm. How the less ministry it would be, it would be kind of like it would be like a little fog, right? And you say, Well, I kinda 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 see it. But now since we've we have the privilege of living post cross and all the revelation of God, we see it clearly. Right? <clears throat> clearest day because of, what, because of the cross of Calvary. But it started with the pro-evangelion in Genesis 3.15 and he began his promise in Genesis 12 with Abraham. He picked one person in grace to give the promise to and starts through what we call salvation history the history of how the salvation came <coughs> down through the <coughs> so one day he will fulfill what we call the land covenant when he comes the second time and sets up his kingdom we call it the millennial <coughs> kingdom of revelation 20 which will be the vestibule into the new heavens and new earth. He will fulfill the aspect of the people of God because he will bring his people to faith. And he will be the blessing of God by bringing forth the new covenant so that we may have our salvation. So, I do this all the time. But I like to do it. Yeah. The people who's not coming to Christ yet, like I had a friend that she's a Jewish. What's her covenant? She does. She don't believe in the Messiah, but she practices Torah and all of that. Well, I would say, just to her, in making what you just said is, she doesn't. Uh, she doesn't believe in her. Jewish beliefs then, which is okay. I mean, that's where she is. Mm -hmm. But she doesn't believe, I mean, in the, you know, I'm not trying to make this Christian at this moment. She doesn't look because the promise of the Messiah is all through the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. So she doesn't believe the Old Testament. That's okay. A lot of people don't believe the Old Testament. A lot of Jewish people don't either. But that's where she is. You know, it, and if you have some opportunity if God is pleased you could tell her gosh what a blessing the Jewish race had to have the promise of a Messiah that would come and I found it in your scriptures of the Old Testament 
And I found that he would be born of a virgin in chapter 7, verse 14 of Isaiah. That he would come as a child in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. And you could just start walking through passages. He would be born in Bethlehem, house of bread, in Bethlehem, Micah 5, 2. And you could just start going through the Old Testament, looking at verses, and, oh, what a promise. And he has come. Well, I don't believe it. Okay. Man, it's sure beautiful. Because, see, you're just bringing forth the Word. Let the Word and God's Holy Spirit do His work. I can't convince them. John? <laughs> I, saw, I thought they believed, some some Jewish people, they believe in the Old Testament. They just don't believe that the Messiah has come yet, right? Yeah, but I was just saying yeah. her in that right. situation, right. she doesn't even believe what most Jewish Orthodox or conservative, you usually have to say Orthodox because it's a denomination. We would call it in, in, uh, in uh, Christian aspects. There are different understandings of Judaism and the Orthodox, and especially the ultra-Orthodox, actually believe in the literally of what the Old Testament says. So when I talk to them, I can go to the Old Testament and we can, we can have fun. But if it's a Reformed a Judaism or something like that, they don't necessarily believe. Well, we got Christian denominations that now are not believing the Bible too, so we got it on our side too. <laughs> But don't in the synagogues they read from the, the Old Testament? They do a reading, but they don't really read Isaiah 53. That's because, what I've been right, told. Because of the fact that it really like, points to Christ. Yeah, they, they kind of, it, it, if it's the regular synagogues that I have been, mm -hmm. uh, uh, been told about, and they're going through the, the typical lect lecterns with which they know right. when to read, they will not read Isaiah 53. Right, they skip that. They will skip it. Matter of fact, if, if you have an opportunity to read Isaiah 53 to a Jewish person, sometimes they say, well, I don't believe in the New Testament. And you can just but it's, but it's the Old Testament. It's not the New Testament. It's your, it's your book in the Old Testament. Isaiah 53. It'll shock them. Not every one of them. Because they believe it's a sin to read the New Testament. Some do. Yeah. And then there are well, there's different ones to do yeah. different things. But, you know, you share Jesus. You know. Yeah. Share, share it. I mean, only, you know, and when you share, you're, you're, you're looking at a stoplight, okay? Is it green? Is it yellow? Mm -hmm. Or is it now red? Yeah. If it's red, stop. Because if you continue on, that'll be the last time you'll be able to say it ever. Mm -hmm. So you, when you're sharing, you're, you're trying to discern, well, now has it gone to a yellow cautious light now, or should I hold back a little bit so I can share later on? So I'm looking for the green light or yellow light or red light so I know how much I can share at that moment. Mm -hmm. Practical stuff, right? Excellent. Well, so this is what we're looking at then. The land covenant will ultimately be fulfilled in the kingdom. The Davidic covenant will be ultimately fulfilled in the kingdom, of the millennial kingdom when Christ comes. The new covenant has its application to the, to the New Testament because if you are in Christ, I, I, I'm in the mediator of the new covenant, I get benefits, <laughs> okay? But I can't fulfill it because it wasn't given to me. But it will ultimately be fulfilled also in the New Covenant. And the Mosaic Covenant is a conditional covenant. If you do this, I will do this. If you do that, then I'm going to do this. Okay? And so it's a different kind of covenant. All the rest of them that we have listed up here are unconditional. It depends ultimately upon God alone to fulfill them. Okay. All right. Everybody okay? Notice what I'm doing. I'm giving you foundation, aren't I? Of how to think theologically, biblical theology of the Old Testament. You understand that right there. And it's more complicated than just that right there, but I'm giving you simplicity first. You understand that, you can understand what's going on. 
not just in the Old Testament, but also into the New. All right? Um, excuse me, but are you going to put this on Sinus? Uh, it's, the notes are, uh, are on Sinus. From your lecture? Yes, okay. right now. Yeah, they're on right now. Okay. You can go to them right now. <laughs> Whatever he puts up. Yeah, yeah, this is right here. Okay. So, the law, uh, the Israel and the law of Moses is, notice it starts in Exodus 19 and it ends at the cross of Christ. So that makes the Gospels under the Mosaic law, though they're under the New Testament. So be careful how you understand and use the Gospels, okay? All right. Now as we get into... Uh, Certain aspects of the. Uh, Can you ask what you said? I was trying to guess. You didn't gather what you said there. Okay. Not the Mosaic Covenant and the what? Okay. The the Mosaic Covenant right. is the covenant that that is under that you are should understand uh, as you would read and interpret uh, in the Gospels because the Old Covenant does not done away with until Jesus dies at Calvary. Right. Mm -hmm. So when you start the book of Acts, you have this transition. That's why most people misunderstand the book of Acts. You're transitioning from the old covenant into a new covenant era. And so it's in the epistles then that you have full of it. I'm not saying that the, the gospels or the Old Testament is not profitable. It is profitable, but it's profitable if you understand what people and when people are under it. Right. I am no longer under the Mosaic Law, right. though the Mosaic Law is good to understand. It has practical applications at times if I do it hermeneutically correctly, but if I don't, I'm a legalist. So you have to be careful. Yeah, I, I just missed the part where you were talking about the where the transition was. Sure, I sure. And so the upper room discourses of John begins to already begin to push you into the New Covenant age, even though it's in the Gospels. But it's, that's only when you begin the transition and then across into the book of Acts uh, and then to the epistles. So we get to understand the book. All right, are you okay? We're looking at big picture stuff now, all right? But it does have importance of how you understand things. This will help you with the rest of your studies. Okay. All right. Let's now look at some uh, uh, some literature analysis of the narrative genre of the Old Testament, and I'm taking this from Dr. Loken from his book. He is an expert in the area of hermeneutics in the area of literature. He did some of his doctoral dissertation in that. And so, why am I giving you that? What does Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy involve Liter uh, in a, a literature situation? Well, it is a narrative. It's, most of it's telling you about history, right? Well, then how do, how do we learn... How, what are some of the things that we need to know so that we can better understand the writer and how he understood it and so that we may have the authorial intent of what the author meant by what he said? The culture. By, by, the, setting. by the culture, by looking at literature how, how, uh, and the narrative because most, most of it is narrative. <clears throat> okay. Why would I want the authorial intent of the author? Do you know what I mean by authorial intent? Yeah, yeah, the personal. author's intent. Yeah. Content yes, brother. So you could well that would tell you how he wrote it and what he wants the readers to come away with. Good. Yeah. And why would I want to know that? Context is king. Context is king, and why would I want to know the information that the context gives me? So you can get the right interpretation. So I get the right interpretation, and why would I want the right interpretation? So you can have the right application. So I know what God said. Yeah. 
If I understand the authorial intent of the author, then I can understand what God wanted to say. Because God inspired the, the uh, writings of the writers. You with me? And if I can understand his understanding, I'm getting God's understanding. Okay? That's hermeneutics, right? That's it. I want you so you should say, I don't prop, I don't care what you say about what the Bible says, I don't care what so and so says, I don't care what you know Billy Graham says, this, that, and the other. I want to know what the author meant right. by what he said when he said it. And if you say that, then I want to hear it. You with me? Mm -hmm. So it's, it didn't make any difference with my opinion. What do you believe the author meant by what he said when he wrote? And that's what we were looking for. Because that's the inspired text for which God speaks. Okay? Truth comes through the scriptures. All right? So we need, if you're dealing with narrative you need to know the setting what is the setting it involves the physical setting would be the environment of the action the temporary setting in other words the historical aspects the cultural setting the the beliefs of the the attitudes the custom of that day all come to play doesn't it so do you need to know the culture of 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 uh, of back uh, in genesis time Yes. The more you know the culture, better maybe you under, not misunderstand what they're trying to say. Right. How, how many have been to another culture and you uh, they say something and you kind of go, what in the world was that? <laughs> or you say something and, and boy, did you put your foot in it? Because you didn't know the culture. You don't say that here. <laughs> Are you with me? Mm -hmm. So the more... I can understand that, the better I can understand what he's saying. Okay. When was this written? When was, well, it was written in the second century B.C. Did you live back then? Okay. So we need to know the culture back then, the settings. Characterizations. It is developed by a direct statement by the character or an indirectly by a character's speech or action or reinforced by analogy uh, David's treachery compared to Uriah's faithfulness that kind of story kind of helps to see there are different categories of characters protagonists the main character antagonist the one that what goes against the protagonist the good guy usually, right? The foils, which character that it reinforces or the contrast of the protagonist or the antagonist. And the archetypal uh, characters such as God and Satan. Okay. A lot of the narrative assumes you know these things. It assumes that you have understanding of the Torah and the moral aspects of it. Did you, did you know that? They'll tell, do you know there's stories in the Bible that are unbiblical in the sense of the character of what happened? Somebody killed somebody or murdered somebody. And they just tell the story. But they assume that you realize it's not what? It's not good. And a lot of times the consequences, you can pick it out. Are you with me? Yeah. So they assume that you know certain things. And if you don't know those things, you may misunderstand what's being said and why it's in there. And so therefore, understanding these narrative genre is important in interpretation. Plot. It is the organizing force through which the meaning of the narrative is communicated. We often talk about the plot of a movie, right? It involves the sequence of scenes. Often it involves conflict, which is ultimately re resolved. Riken, a, a, a specific uh, uh, author, identifies 12 common archetype uh, plot motifs. 
the quest of trying to do something, the death and rebirth of motif, the initiative, the journey, the tragedy, or the fall from innocence, the comedian, the prosperity to, do, to tragedy, to success, a crime and punishment scene, a temptation, a rescue, a suffering servant motif, a rags to riches motif, <laughs> movement from ignorance to epiphany, not understanding, but now I do. All those are found in the Old Testament, in the narrative. You find it in any story. And the more you understand that, maybe better is how you can interpret it correctly instead of just read. Point of view. The narrator controls the story and provides unity to the narrative. It is through the narrative's point of view that we observe and evaluate the events of the story. In first-person narrative, the storyteller serves as the character in the story. For example, Nehemiah and Habakkuk. In third-person narrative, the story is told through his perspective, but he does not appear as a character, like Ruth and Esther. Both narrations, the storyteller appears to know everything even the desires and inner thoughts of somebody. The narrator's point of view is expressed by inserting direct comments sometimes, parenthetical stuff sometimes, uh, allowing the, the narrative to speak by the conversation of the characters. Different ways the point of view has come from. Sometimes that helps to understand the story correctly. The style, it is narrative techniques which give structural unity, such as repetition, word plays, such as puns and irony, um, parallelisms. If you've had your wisdom course, you know what parallelisms are. Chiasms, we can talk about that. Inclusi inclusios, irony, chrono chronology of ordering and omissions. There's all kinds of ways of studying just literature and what it does. And the more you know that in the narrative, because the authors use those techniques also to communicate their truth. So all that stuff you learned in English literature that you thought, man, I'm glad I got rid of that, can come to play now. Okay? As you learn the story. And now they have very much importance, right? Because I not want to understand what the text means because it's God's word. All right? You everybody okay? Mm -hmm. I notice everybody's still awake, so we're good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm trying to make it interesting. <clears throat> you are. Now, we need to talk about the canon of the Old Testament. Now. If that word was C-A-N-N-O-N, you would shoot it. <laughs> okay? But if, when it's just C-A-N-O-N, we're talking about something completely different than a cannon that shoots. It means a standard by which to see whether something is let in or it is not a part of a standard that we will keep. The cannon. It is... It is the standard by which you are measuring something to see whether it is uh, going to be let into, let's just make it literature, okay? Whether that literature is inspired or it is not. The standard by which you measure if the literature is inspired or not? Correct. So we'll say, what is the canon of the Old Testament? Well, it's 39 bucks. What's the canon of the New Testament? What's 26. 27 books. We've got 66 books that are in the canon of Scripture that were recognized by God's people that God wanted in the canon. Yes. Will we get into any of the other books that are not canon? Well, the Old Testament. Probably 
uh, we will we will mention some, but I'm not going to, eat to talk about them because it, it, I won't spend all my time okay. in the text. When I deal with uh, canonicity, I have a, all kinds of le lectures dealing with um, dealing with the Old Testament and with the New Testament. We can spend a great deal, but that's a theological course that we deal with. So we okay. do deal with those. We will see that the, the Apocrypha uh, are, uh, was never recognized by uh, God's people as part of the canon of Scripture, even though a few people did, but never completely... Uh, uh, never the know, council. Uh, uh, no council, no uh, person uh, uh, of authority ever said anything uh, that ultimately brought the... Uh, the Apoph Apocrypha into the into the canon of Scripture until the 1500s in the Counter Reformation, the councils of the Council of Trent mm -hmm. for the Roman Church, and they only took some of the Apocrypha. So for 1500 years, they were rejected until the 1500s. Okay. Now, what about the uh, and the Protestants did not recognize it. What about the what's his? Um, he was the other guy that. Uh, um, ascended into heaven using Genesis. Enoch. Verses. Enoch, yeah. the book of Enoch. Yeah. Yeah, it's still an apocrypha book. Okay. Uh, some people will say Jude uh, quotes from that and they get all exercised by it. Uh, but Paul will quote in Acts 17 a pagan poet. Sure. Uh, and it, just because a clock, is, a clock is broken is correct two times a day, you know. So just, it, it, he's picking a point that he happens to be correct, correct on, correct. and he's not saying that that writing is inspired. Okay. As, just like we might say, which I don't recommend, you know, Sigmund Freud, what he said here is correct, <laughs> and he might say something, <laughs> but you're not by that saying, you're not endorsing uh, you're no. go after Sigmund right. Freud, yeah. you just have to say this point, he happened to be correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. So it's that kind of thing. Okay. Good, good question, though. Yeah. Good question. All right. Uh, the Jewish canon division was the law, the prophets, and the writings. And a reason why I did that is in Luke chapter 24, mm -hmm. Jesus basically gives this um, division <clears throat> of the scriptures, indicating everybody in the New Testament, uh, New Testament time would understand him. He, uh, he says the law of the prophets and the Psalms, which is the beginning of the uh, writings, and everybody would know what he meant by that. The twenty, uh, uh, th thirty-nine books of the Old Testament. Everybody would know that. That was just how they would say it. So Jesus recognized the thirty-nine books of the Old Testament, and if it's good enough for Jesus, good enough for me. <laughs> okay, so the law, the prophets, and the writings. And this is the Jewish canon, so if you have a Hebrew text, you would have it in this order. Okay. And there's reasons why, but it's not important to come forth at this time. Um, there's also a two fold division. The law and the prophets are used. And that would also be an indication of of the entire Old Testament time. So there's a threefold division and there is a twofold division. And then Jesus talks about from, uh, let's see, was it Matthew, anyway. Matthew 7, 5, 17? No, uh, the one that he says from the prophet Enoch to Zechariah you have been disobedient, this, that, and the other, and dealing, therefore dealing with Genesis all the way through most of Second Chronicles, which would be the entire Old Testament. Thirteen. Mm -hmm. Anyway. So, introduction now to the Pentateuch. I've been giving you introductions of introductions <laughs> and introductions. <laughs> Gave you an introduction to the biblical theology of the Old Testament. Gave you briefings on things. So this is kind of a hodgepodge lecture so that next week, Lord willing, we'll hit in pretty close to uh, 
getting into the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch, the church as a whole, accepted at face value that the Pentateuch was composed by Moses sometime in the 15th century B.C., 1400s, until the rise of the deistic philosophy in the 18th century A.D. Did you hear what I said? In other words, from we have the, the church and the Old Testament have always believed it was Moses who wrote it in the 1500 B.C. until the 18th century, 1700 A.D. And then we got to know better. I don't think so. By a pantheistic Benedict Spinoza who denies Moses' authorship, but this view did not gain much support until the 18th century, 1700s. All right? What am I saying? I'm saying we didn't have a problem with the authorship of Moses until the 18th century. Everybody believed who was a believer in the literature. Most, now, you're talking about philosophers who were unbelievers. They may, I don't know what they're saying. But we did not have a problem with the mosaic authorship of Moses' writings until the 18th century, 1700s. All right. And you say to yourself, I don't, I don't know if you, I, I'm an inquisitive person. I mean, what happened? What, what happened that we had this, everybody in lockstep understands then, and all of a sudden things begin to change? The enlightenment. Okay. You're right. We have the emergement of postmodernism, which comes from the Enlightenment. These are all terms that are used in history, whether you're in secular or Christian history, but they talk about the Enlightenment. Before the 18th century or the 1700s in the United States specifically, revelation and reason was king. Okay? In other words, everybody, even though they may not believe the Bible, they say, oh, yeah, they know the good book. That's the good book. You know? <laughs> we even had that even in to the, to the 19 uh, 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 hundreds, right? I mean, I, I remember as a kid, people would say, oh, yeah, that's a good book. Yeah. They didn't believe the good book, but, you know, it's a good book. <laughs> you don't have people saying that much anymore, do you? Mm -hmm. they, you, you, you you stand up in some kind of talk show and yell and other, say something about the Bible, you will be booed, most likely. Unless you're in a Christian environment. And sometimes in Christian environments you may be booed. They don't so, call it the good yeah. book. They don't really call it the good book anymore. They call it like a book of fables and myths. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And so revelation, God's word, and our reasoning through the revelation was king. In other words, it was one that was respected. But when the Enlightenment came, uh, I don't know. I don't really call it Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. I call it a, a, a darkening. Yeah. <laughs> but they, but historically, as you study history, uh, you will say the Enlightenment came, and these philosophers began to begin to speculate beyond uh, the the revelation of God's word, and began to divorce themselves from the Scriptures and saying what they think things are. Okay, and when that happened, we call the, most historians call it modernism came in, and uh, they began to ask what is true, and uh, revelation and the tradition of that revelation was buried, and now reason became king. Man's reason was the authority. His philosophy and what he thought. And what happens is you begin to read, you read this philosopher and he had this opinion, and, and uh, they, some people like it, and then this, another philosopher came and he did something different, and another philosopher, and another one, and another one, and another one, and it just, you know, grab back, which philosopher you want. And now we live in what is called post modernity. Past modernism. We're still fighting modernism, don't get me wrong, but we are now also fitting uh, what is called postmodernism. Not what is true, 
But what is truth? <clears throat> they believe, at least the modernism, and I would say, well, this is true. And they say, no, well, this is true. And we'd have, you know, we'd battle it out between what's true. And what they say, well, this is my truth. Mm -hmm. And that's your truth. And that's your truth. But there's no capital T truth because if you say that, you're intolerant because you're saying my truth's wrong. Mm -hmm. And that's what we are. But that's what I have to say to them. So I, am I called intolerant? Yeah, I'm called intolerant. Though I hope I am tolerant, but I'm intolerant in the sense that I, I, I know what the truth is and I'm not backing off it. I hope I am kind. I hope how I speak the truth is in love. But I can't back off from the truth. Even if it hurts the person, well, you just crushed my truth. What is truth? Truth is whatever conforms to the mind of God. How do you know the mind of God? Yeah. Through the Word of God. Okay? This is why this is so important. I know the truth through the Word. And you're going to out in the world today where everybody says they got the truth. And this is my truth and this that and the other. And if you say anything that is capital T truth, this is truth for everybody, you are really, you, you get, people get angry at you. Mm -hmm. Because you're in, that's what they call intolerant. Yeah. Okay. I want to be as loving as I can. But I'm firm. I'm sorry. I didn't start that. You take that up with God. <laughs> right? Gotta take that up with God. I mean. You know, if it's up to me, you're in. But it ain't up to me. I mean, I didn't write it. This is it. And you stray from the truth, and you are in an ocean. Or you're in the hurricane of, of, of life and will be destroyed. So that's what's going on. That's what happened. Okay? That's why I'm so passionate about these things. Because I don't want you to stray from the truth. I've seen people come here. Not many that I know of. And they begin to lift their anchor from the Scriptures. And when you lift your anchor from the authority of the Scriptures, you're in trouble. Sure, there may be things that they throw at you that you don't know. I don't know the answer to that. But guess what? You can find the answer. Just because you don't know the answer right now, you can find the answer. <coughs> All right. I say this because I want you to see what they're doing to the Old Testament, even today. What I'm about to show you is what we often use the phrase liberal theologians and uh, liberal uh, people who deal with the scripture. Now, I'm not talking about political, okay? Right. So when I use the word liberal, I'm not talking about uh, political stuff. I'm talking about people who are liberal with the scriptures and they, they don't necessarily believe that it's the Word of God, okay? And so they have ways of, of scholarship, Liberal scholarship. That, that, that you begin to listen to and you don't know the answer to, and, and so people then begin to buy it. Well, there's answers to them. And again, I go every year to Evangelical Theological Society where all evangelical, most evangelical scholars will come but I also go to Society of Biblical Literatures, which is vaguely Christian, okay? I mean, you got, you got all flavors and stripes, okay? And many of them are not, but they're scholars, and they're writing books and doing things. And we have, what I'm about to tell you, if they knew I was teaching that, they would just, they would have a field day on me. But I don't care, you know? 
I, I know what I believe and I know what it does and I want you to have the truth. And so what I'm about to tell you is when you pick up an Old Testament book and you start hearing them say, well, J wrote this and E wrote this and P wrote this, and you know you're right in the middle of liberal, biblical, or th uh, theological studies. Mm -hmm. Okay? So that's why I'm going to take this. They don't believe Moses wrote the, the five books of what we call the Pentateuch. They believe that people wrote it down through different centuries from uh, 9th century B.C. down to the 5th or 4th century B.C. And it was redacted and uh, redactors, which means people who took a look at the scriptures and put them together and just that and the other, and that's what we got. And it's not inspired. Yeah. Yes, before coming to CBS, I took a class with an Anglican liberal, and he said that the Pentateuch was compiled, wasn't compiled until uh, uh, Israel was in Babylon. Yes. And Fifth or sixth century BC. Uh, mm -hmm. The myths from the, wow. from the Babylonian. Yes. That's typical of the type of things that you will read in what I, for example, if you pick up a, um, this is a good one, okay? This one is by Gleason Archer, uh, an unbelievable uh, scholar, the survey of the Old Testament introduction, and he uh, debunks what you just said. It goes through evidence, uh, you know, I can't give you all the stuff that's in here, you'd, 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 you'd be drowning, Okay. But, but thank God for men like this who are taking these liberal scholars and showing the, how they are wrong in their understanding. This is not the only one. There's many others. You can get them in all different um, uh, what shall I say, degrees of difficulty to read. Uh, this one is not as hard, especially after my introduction, I think, you will be able to read people like uh, Gleason Archie, who is a top-notch Old Testament scholar. He was a linguist. I think he learned 15 languages. Hmm. and was able to work in all 15, in, especially in Semitics and stuff like that. So we have scholars in the Old Testament that are, um, are evangelical. My good friend, Dr. Randall Price, is a top-notch uh, Old Testament scholar, archaeologist, right in there. Uh, bring, he's done uh, 12 years digs in the in Qumran. is coming forth with stuff uh, from an even, as an evangelical, bringing forth scholarship because they look upon us like you guys don't do anything. Oh, yeah, we do. Mm -hmm. There's now uh, evangelical scholars almost in every field uh, and, and contributing to the fields and bringing forth the truth of God's word. And it, it wasn't always that way. We lost the battle in the 1920s to liberalism. Mm. And all the schools went. Mm. When did Dallas Seminary become a, a seminary? 1924. 1924. Why? There weren't any seminaries left. How about Westminster Theological Seminary? Even though I would disagree on many things, they're, over, they're very, very evangelical. 1929. It, it, we lost and then we had to bring it back. Uh, Evangelical Theological Society, ETS. Why did we start that? Because evangelicals were having trouble and now we're being, having to be respected. When Daryl Bach gives a two volume uh, over uh, 2,000 pages in uh, a commentary on the book of Luke, the, if you're going to be a Lukean scholar, you're going to have to read him. He's an evangelical. So we're beginning to come back and produce articles and challenge them so that we can say, yes, there is answers to that. You don't have to believe the liberals. There are good, solid, biblical texts that you can go to that explains these truths. Okay? The professors here at CBS, they have the same theology or not? Or they don't teach here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma now, well, there are, there are things that we can differ on that don't make yeah. any big difference, okay? Uh, you know, 
Uh, but if you're if you're saying that the fundamentals of what I've been talking about, you don't teach here. I'm a stickler on that. <laughs> Me and Dr. Loken are the gatekeepers. <laughs> <laughs> Why? I mean, go somewhere else. Man. We love you. And even you may be a believer, but if you don't if you don't understand the truths of God's word, yeah. so you know. If you had Dr. Loken and I together, would you find some difference? Of course, yes. but not anything that's going to be big. Um, just not. We're, we're in the theology of it, we're right there together, praise God. So, the documentary hypothesis. It is a hypothesis. <laughs> it's not good. Definition. The Pentateuch was a compilation. You got, Alexander, a compilation of many sources composed of different times over five centuries and completed long after Moses. I don't believe that. But that's what you find out there. That's what he was taught in that course. Mm -hmm. Okay. The originator of, of the hypothesis. I like it because it's a hypothesis, which means it hasn't been proven. It was a process of development that began in the middle of the 1700s until late part of the 1800s. Julian Wellhauser, I think he's a German, K.H. Groff, another German, brought forth a definitive formula, J.E.D.P., in 1876 to 1878, and Charles A. Bridges and Henry P. Smith were champions in the United States of America. They took it from Germany. So, hi, the documentary hypothesis, which I don't believe, okay, and I don't think it's true, but I want you to know about it because you're going to be facing it by reading certain things. Therefore, we must treat the documentary hypothesis as still a live issue today, even though liberal scholarship on the European continent has administrated well nigh fatal blows to nearly all of its function. You, do you hear what I just said? Even the liberal scholars are debunking it, uh, the, 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 the original uh, hypothesis, but they're just trying to find something that's better. You see what I'm saying? They're not going to come back and say, well, I guess Moses wrote it. No, they're not going back to that. But one scholarship will say, well, this is wrong. Well, you guys got it. And then somebody come back and say, well, maybe it's this way. And then another scholar will say, no, that's wrong. And so they're just debunking each other. But they're, but, and they're not coming up with necessarily another uh, one where everybody agrees on. Everybody's eating everybody else. The sharks are out. Basically, anything but Moses. Either thing but Moses. Yeah. And when I see something in a, in a crowd or something, I usually get a real... You know, I just accidentally just come out with what I believe, you know. I, I, I get this silence. You know, like, he didn't really say that, did he? You don't believe Moses wrote that, did you? Yeah, I do. <laughs> okay. They think I'm a dummy. But then when you begin to read this stuff, I'm going to say, well, which theory of the, of the theories do you hold? Because everybody's chewing everybody else up and spitting them out. Say, oh, no, no, that, that couldn't be true. That part of it could not be P, it has to be E. Well, we don't believe E's anymore. We think this. And so everybody's doing everybody else, and do, but they're not coming in and saying, well, this is it. But they're sure, so, uh, surely Moses didn't do it. You with me? They're denying other parts of the scripture that say that Moses Yeah, that's exactly true. <laughs> the description of the four documents is J, Jehovah, E, Elohim, D, the Deuteronomist, and P, the priest. Okay? So Yahwehist, they would say, they used to say, written about by an unknown author in Judah about 1850 B.C., deals with a personal biographies and characters and ethics and theology. It produced some of the Genesis, Exodus, and Numbers, and a few verses in Deuteronomy. It had little interest in the uh, sacrifices and ritual. I'm telling you the, the original basic 
uh, hypothesis, okay? Because they, everybody's eating each other up on these, these things. They don't believe the hypothesis anymore. They're trying to make, improve it, but when they try to improve it, everybody's eat, it's like the sharks are eating the sharks. But this was the original uh, hypothesis of how it was. They don't believe that today. Uh, at least all of it. Elohimus was written about 750 BC by an unknown writer in the Israel and deals with particulars like the origin of place, names, and customs. Um, later redactor, a later redactor, somebody that, that corrects something. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, edited J and E, and most of E was left out, probably around 650 BC. I'm not giving you reasons why they say this. I'm just telling you what the, the thing is right this moment. The D, Deuteronomist, written about 621 BC, um, to compel uh, abandonment of places of false worship and all worship to instead be made in Jerusalem basically the book of Deuteronomy. Later, the same school reworked the historical account in Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings. So they got to work on that too. Okay. Priestly, the last one, J-E-D-P, right? So you can remember the J-E-D-P theory. Hypothesis, okay? Written between 570 to 400 B.C. and deals with the origin of place Situations of the theocracy also concerned with details of sacrifice rituals and origins and genealogical lists. It produced some of Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, and all of Leviticus. Now, I want you to, to take note of the times they said these were. Okay? The last two dealt with 621. 1 B.C., so therefore in the 7th century B.C. And the last one was 500 to 400, so you're looking at the 4th and 5th <coughs> century B.C. Okay? Now, that's going to become important in just a minute. So, some of the presupposition of the documenting hypothesis, an evolutionary unilinear, uh, unilinear approach to Israel's history, it's good for evolutionists, right? The possibility of dividing the Pentateuch text on the basis of stylistic criteria. So the reason why they do it is maybe, for example, well, you don't read Hebrew, but um, in Genesis chapter 1, uh, uh, the writer uh, Moses uses Elohim. But in chapter 2, he uses Yahweh. And so they say, well, see, that was two different writers. You mean a God? that the same person can't use two different names for God? <laughs> What's wrong with you guys? What's, be, give me a break. And you're using that as your criteria? Don't get me on that. <laughs> a simple conflation of documents by the redactors. Uh, easy determination of the purposes and methods behind the documents and redaction. They think it's easy. It is. You know why I know it is? They're eating each other up now. Yeah. Every, they're taking the theories and, and, and debunking certain parts of the theories. <laughs> so I guess it isn't so easy, is it? Everybody, it's like the sharks are eating the sharks, as I said. Now, a very important discovery happened in 1979. In uh, the Valley of Hinnom, or the Hinnom Valley. <clears throat> if you've been to Israel, you know that's one of the valleys surrounding Jerusalem. It was two phylacteries, about the small size of a cigarette, that were rolled up. And finally, by God's grace, in my opinion, they were able to unroll these. And they were, uh, they knew that the, if the uh, pottery or things that they found in the ground was in the period of the 7th century B.C., 600 B.C. 
and they discovered a sketching of numbers, actually the Hebrew text of numbers mm -hmm. on this phylactery in the 16th, in, in 600 BC at least. So what did that just do? Destroyed their timeline. Just tried to destroy their timeline. <laughs> and I just go, I just <laughs> smile, I just love it. Now what are you going to do? <laughs> so that, that archaeologists do that for us, right? This is the oldest record that we have of the, of the Bible in Hebrew. I've actually seen it at the museum in Yerushalayim. All right. I get excited about those things. <laughs> so this is the old documentary hypothesis all the way down to the 6th century, right? Really, it was down to the 500s and the 400s, right? Mm -hmm. So they were cheating a little bit on that one, my P there. So they had to do some reworking, you know. Even that P is... Is, is low. Why? Because we're talking about n our, our numbers mm -hmm. text here. Right. So we're, we're getting archaeological things, not just theoretical things that they're eating each other up on. We've got now archaeological things that doesn't fit their timeline. <coughs> I love it. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. That's why I'm glad my friend Randy Price is an archaeologist. Yeah, he's He's finding stuff. I'm praying he finds an, a scroll. Mm -hmm. Man, that would be great. He found this. He did find uh, his first one in, what, 60 years? Uh, a cave that had the scrolls in them, but they were, of course, already gone. But it's now uh, the 12th cave, mm -hmm. and uh, he was recognized by that uh, among the scholars. All right. Very brief evaluation of the documentary hypothesis. Don't go to sleep on me now, okay? <laughs> okay. Uh, we're going to be th go through this pretty quick. Presupposition. Most people who hold to this view do not believe in the supernatural miracles. Well, if they don't believe in miracles, then what are they going to say about the text? <laughs> I mean, they're already prejudiced, uh. well, you know. The style of writing. This hypothesis limits writers in their vocabulary. For example, only one word for God. If they use two different words, they say, well, that's not author. And only one style of writing which is not known or rare in history, historical literature. People never, I mean, people use different names for all kinds of things. Right? I mean, I call him God sometimes, and I call him Lord. Right. That's a lot of names. And I'm just saying God. <laughs> <laughs> they regard the biblical data as unreliable and suspect and may disregard biblical content when non-biblical data disagrees with it. A survey of the scholarly works of form criticism, we don't have to know about that, or documentary hypothesis demonstrates that there is not one theory that is dominant. Though they are contradicting each other in their views, they would be consistent in their rejection of the conservative view of Moses' authorship. Mm -hmm. they, 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 are, they are tearing everybody, each other up, Saying, well, that, no, I don't believe that. And, that, and so, on. how can you say, well, what, what is the theory? Because you don't know what the theory is because there's no dominant theory coming forth because everybody's eating each other up. Right. But there's one thing they are definitely all agree on Moses did, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I love this by my pain. This review of activity in the field of Old Testament criticism during the last quarter century has revealed a chaos of conflicting trends, ending and contradictory results, which create an impression of ineffectiveness in the type of research. The conclusion seems unavoidable that the higher criticism has long since passed the age of constructive achievement. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
All right, circular reason. The Bible is no supernatural revelation and thus no such thing as a supernaturalism. Well, of course it wouldn't be. If you don't believe there's supernaturalism, then there can't be any. That's circular. Thus, it is absolutely obligatory to find a rationalistic, humanistic explanation for the miracles or God's manifesting features or episodes in the scriptures. Well, if you're already saying that it can't be one, then you've got to do something different instead of proving it. The biases, the biased view of the Bible, they claim their view is based upon the text itself, but the text is consistently evaded whenever the text seems to go counter to their theory. They like the text until the text doesn't like them. Erroneous view of the writing style of the Bible. They deny that the writers of the Bible were incapable of using more than one name for God. We've already talked about that. More than one style of writing. Or more than one synonym, uh, synonym for a single idea or a circle of interest. Can an author have different understandings or come forth with different ideas of how to do something? Sure you can. But they say, oh no, if, that, if that's the case, then it had to be another writer, and so therefore we got all these things. See what he's doing here? Shouldn't it read, they deny that the writers of the Bible were capable of abusing more than one yeah. man for God? <coughs> okay. I'll change that. That's good. All right. Subjective bias in the Hebrew uh, scriptures as archaeological evidence. Consistently, where any discrepancy with a pagan document, the, the heathen source is given preference as a historical witness. Not the Bible. Their presupposition. Israel's religion was merely human in origin like other religions and it is explained by the product of evolution. You wonder why they have problems. They get evolution. The so-called discrepancies. No allowances for reconciling accepted for, the, for their alleged discrepancies in the Bible. But often exploited uh, uh, discrepancies to to prove diversity of sources. Well, see, that was a diversity of source because that was wrong, and this, that, they were getting different data. That's how they do it. Other Semitic literature. Now, this was interesting to me. Other ancient Semitic literature show many incidences of repetition and duplication by the same author, and they do not conclude there were diverse authors. But Hebrew literature, repetition and duplication, they do. <laughs> see, the in, see their inconsistency? Yeah. The dating of the composition of the Bible. They have confidence in their form and source criticism to date a document. They also freely amend the text by substituting more common words for the rare or unusual words in the MT, the Masoretic text, which is the Hebrew text. In other words, they find a weird word, they go, you know, that really was in there. Somebody came in and did something, so we'll change that word. I'm going, for what for? A foreigner's living in an entirely different age and cultures they have felt themselves competent to discard or reshuffle phrases or entire verses whenever the Occidental conception, I had to look that up, a Western con concept, in other words, uh, of consistency or style have been offended. Oh. They think this is offending. They could have written that. They could have done that. So we got to change. Surely they didn't write that. It's pretty arrogant. Yeah. The final judge of events and what happens. They assume that scholars today more than 3,400 years later based largely on philosophical <clears throat> theories are more reliable, able to reconstruct the way things happen 
than could the ancient authors themselves, even those who are removed no more than 600 to 1,000 years by critics' dates. Well, here are some um, documents. If you want an article by Garrett, that will give you 30, page 34 to 51, some of the things I've been saying. Umberto Casuto, a Jewish scholar, not a Christian, also wrote a book against the documentary hypothesis. <laughs> because what? It was destroying the Old Testament. Gleason Archer, which is I took most of my quotes from today, and then some older works by Ernest Wilhelm Hinstenberg and William Henry Green. Now, those are not the only ones. I could have filled up page after page after page, okay? Mm -hmm. But I, I just want you to have an introduction. So what should you take away from this? Well, this. Moses is the author of the Pentateuch. <laughs> okay. Why? The Pentateuch tells me so. Okay. The Pentateuch testifies that Moses composed it. They call it the law of Moses. Moses. Constantly. Other Old Testament books. Other Old Testament books testify that Moses wrote the Pentateuch. I didn't list them all, okay? I got tired, but I, I listed Joshua, First and Second Kings, Ezra, Daniel, some of the old, uh, newer ones and older ones of the text, and they all talk about the Moses, and he wrote it. It's the law of Moses. Okay? And also, the New Testament testifies to it. Strong that Moses wrote it. It is difficult to embrace the documentary theory without attributing either falsehood or error to Jesus Christ and the apostles. Because Jesus said, yeah. Moses wrote certain things. Yeah. Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. So, Moses wrote. But if you say that, they'll think you're a dummy. In scholarly work, but you're not. Okay? And there are, there, if you dig enough, you'll find uh, answers to your questions. And remember, the only thing that the liberals are now uh, agree is that most of them are right. But that's it. <laughs> no, nobody else is necessarily agreeing with anybody else of the documentary hypothesis. Anything it, but truth. It, 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 they're eating each other up. That's the nature of the hypothesis. Okay. Wow. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right, Paul. That's good. So they say they know who did, but they don't know who did. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And I want you to know, I don't care what you, they call you, you can be a scholar and you can know that it is true and stay with the scriptures. Okay? Let's pray. Lord, thank you tonight for these dear ones who have to listen to all this junk about the giant JD and I, I pray that no one ever is fooled yes. by these. These are date scholars who are, are producing so many things. But we don't have to be simpletons. We don't believe this because it's a simpleton. We have concrete uh, truth from God's <laughs> word and from other uh, scholarly men who believes this is true. So we're not just uh, out here doing nothing. It's not that we're not engaging these scholars. We're just allowing them to eat themselves up because they can't determine what is the theory. But our theory is strong because you said it, Lord. And because you said it, we believe it. Yes. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.